Good afternoon, or good morning, sorry. Today is May 18th, 2013, and the time is 10.03 a.m. My name is Kimberly Davis, and I'm conducting an oral history interview at Christ Episcopal Church in Waukegan, Illinois, with John W. Davis, Jr. Please state your name and address for the record. John W. Davis, Jr., 2943 Argonne Drive, North Chicago, Illinois. So today we're going to talk about your history as um, a naval um, enlisted person. So first let's talk about how were you um, entered into the Navy? Were you drafted or were you enlisted? I enlisted. <clears throat> okay. And so where were you at the time? Where were you living? Chicago, Illinois. All right. And then why did you join? I didn't want to get drafted. <laughs> so you enlisted instead of getting drafted anyway. That's correct. Okay, and so why did you pick the Navy? Uh, maybe because I didn't want to go to, I didn't want to be in the Army and go overseas and, and uh, fight. Okay, and I know from your personal history that your father was also in the military. He was in the Army. Medical Corps. And so did that have an influence on, on... No, not really. No? Okay. Do you remember what your first few days were like in the service? Everyone remembers that. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about it. Well, the morning, of, uh, we had to go down to the uh, AFI station. It'd be down there about 5 o'clock in the morning. They did all your physicals and everything. It's, you just sit around and waited. And about 3 o'clock, we went to the airport to fly out, and the plane didn't leave to 8 o'clock. So we flew three hours to San Diego, landed, met this guy who was the meanest person in the world. So we went to, uh, to boot camp. And they gave us all our numbers, serial numbers, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning before we finally got to bed. At 5 o'clock, the lights came on, and we had to get up and start our day. So everyone remembers the first day of boot camp. It's something you'll never forget. What, what kind of feelings were going through you? Well, why did I do this? <laughs> So you were kind of everybody was scared. Okay. Because they didn't know what what to, what was going on. And so the first day of boot camp, what what kind of things did they have you guys doing? Well, you had to learn how to march. Uh, they give you assignments of uh, you took a. Uh, an exam so they can know what you, how your rankings were and everything. It did. The person in charge of the, of our company, he was a chief petty officer and he uh, picked out who wanted to be, who he thought would be the most reliable person responsible so they, they could lead. It was 80 of us. So we could, it was like the uh, recruit uh, drill master. But I wasn't it. With my education, I had two and a half years of college. So they made me the, uh, how did I call this? The journalist, secretary, whatever. And I didn't have to carry a weapon. I had a little knife I put on the side and let them know that I was the secretary. So everybody else had a weapon, uh, M1. And we spent eight weeks, eight weeks together. Every time somebody would mess up, uh, we had to march around the grinder or run around the grinder until we got everything right. And it was really, it was really good to see everybody come together 
as one instead of individual people. We had tests all through boot camp and we graduated in uh, December the 12th. I went in in October the 3rd, so it was eight weeks of training. Then I came home. What year was that? Hmm? What year was that? 1968, right at the height of the Vietnam War. When I had signed up to go into the medical portion, because my dad was a dentist, and uh, I got selected for that, and I came home and then went back to uh, to core school in January, because they let us come home for like three weeks. And then uh, we, uh, I finally got back to San Diego, because I was living in Jackson, Mississippi at the time even though I came in in Chicago. So, went back and was going through core school and everything. And I had a little setback, so I got put back into another company. We graduated this, the 12th of May, 1969. And uh, I went home and <clears throat> my, my wife, my, not my wife at the time, but we were engaged, and uh, I asked her to marry me. And we got married on the seventeenth, seventeenth of uh, May, nineteen sixty-nine. By the way, yesterday was our forty-fourth anniversary. <laughs> so, do you remember any of the instructors you had throughout your training and boot camp? No. No. <laughs> Well, that's okay. How did you make it through boot camp? What, what were some things that helped you through it? Well, I, I really don't know. I guess it was just perseverance. Because you didn't know. Uh, I didn't want to go back home and be a failure. Did you get any letters or, or were you able to call home or things like that? You, you would call home about once a week if you had, if you were a good recruit, as they put it. Mm -hmm. Did you send letters back and forth to people? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you said that you served during the Vietnam War. During Viet while Vietnam was happening, did you go over to Vietnam or were you stationed other other places? When I left core school, I went to Oakland, California, at a hospital. When we got our orders, the company, the class ahead of us. They told us that every class, every other class would go to the Marines and on to Vietnam. But the class that graduated ahead of us didn't go. So when our turn came up, we were looking, and five of us got orders to hospital, and everybody else went to the Marines, and I was one of the lucky ones that went to the hospital. And I was in Oakland, uh, Oakland, California. And around November, I got orders to leave there and go to Subic, Philippines. And don't ask me where that is, <laughs> <laughs> but I found out. So that was a that was an experience. Okay, and then from there, did you serve on any uh, carriers or anything like that? Well, after eighteen months in the Philippines, I came back home. I was supposed to be stationed on the USS Plymouth Rock out of Norfolk, Virginia. So when I got there, the, the ship was in dry dock, which means there was no water underneath it. They were doing repairs on it. And the whole ship's company had to live in the barracks for three months. And then once they put the water, got everything finished, put water on it, we went out for trials and everything because they had to make sure everything was working before they went on deployment. In January of 71, is it 71? Yeah, 71, I, uh, we were scheduled to go to 
the Philippines, I'm not Philippine, but uh, to the uh, to the Pacific Ocean for six months. But we went up to uh, I forgot New Hampshire. Well, we were the closest one in. That this was in the middle of war, uh, the winter, and we were the ship was rocking at 45 degree rolls, and everything was flying everywhere. So when I came back, uh, we got back, and before deployment, I went home because my wife was expecting our first child. And while I was at home, I got a phone call. It was somebody from the ship. Well, one of the my coworkers was scheduled to go to an augmentation program at the base. And he wanted to go overseas, so they swapped with me. I guess you could say I was one of the lucky guys in the world. <laughs> so we drove all night back up there, and I got up. When I went on the ship, everybody said, you're a lucky man. You're not going. So, so when the ship left, I was like Otis Redding. I don't know if you remember Otis Redding. <laughs> I was sitting on the dock of the bay watching the ship roll away. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent six months six months on the naval base. Uh, then I, I hadn't made rank, so I <clears throat> got out. But I had took the test for advancement while I was at home. I was working at the VA, and they sent me a letter saying you had passed the test. I said, okay, so I took it down to the recruiter's office. At that time, I think it was making $8 a day, something like that. It was real. So I asked him if I could come back in. They said, sure, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to like to go to laboratory school. So they sent me up to Portsmouth, Virginia, through the basic laboratory school. I spent eight weeks in there and then stayed, <clears throat> excuse me, I stayed on to, uh, at the uh, clinic there. I was one of the first ones that was stationed at this new clinic. They call yourself flank owners. It was the Joel T. Boone lab, uh, I mean, uh, health clinic in Little Creek, Virginia. So we had to put all the furniture and everything in there and set it up for, for opening. We had a grand opening and all that. So after being stationed there for until night from 72 until May of 74. At that time, I had two children, a son and a daughter. But I was getting ready to be transferred, so I thought about it. I said, let me see if they'll let me go to the advanced school. And they did. So my supervisor at the time, when I got ready to leave, he said, I want you to come back and be in the top 10 of your class. Okay, so when I went to school, the school was a, a, a 13 month long school and we started with 17 students. We went to 19 and graduated 10 and I was number six, which I was really proud of. So we went to Florida. Once we got to Jacksonville, I was stationed down there for from 1975 until 1990, 1980, excuse me. And after that, we, uh, <clears throat> I was supposed to be transferred. They had me going to uh, Okinawa, Japan, to a research facility. You know, about two weeks, two weeks before we were supposed to leave, we had to all get our shots. But the day before we got our shots, I got a phone call. They said that it closed down the facility. So he was talking to me about orders, where, where, where do I want to go? So he kept naming off ships and marine units, and then he came across the marine air unit. And he named another name. I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
what did you say about that Marine Air Wing? So he said, yeah, 2nd Marine Division Air Wing in North Carolina. I said, I'll take that. So then he goes on. I've been in the Navy mm, at that time about 14 years. What's it, 14? 12. So I, uh, he said, well, you have to go to field medical school in order to be with the uh, Marines. So I said, okay, yeah, that was in Camp Lejeune, which is about 50 miles up the road. And at that time, I was an E6, the first class. So when I went to the school, everybody that was in the school were young kids with lower rates. And being an E6, I was considered a staff NCO as in the Marine Corps. So I had my own, I lived in the barracks, I had my own private room. And there are all the amenities I could go everywhere I want to. I didn't have to check in with anybody. Uh, that was five weeks. And then I went to uh, Cherry Point, checked in, and asked for housing. They said, well, we already have you set up. So my wife and kids got in the car the next morning. Again. They packed up from Jacksonville. She drove up there. And the next morning, the guy with the uh, uh, furniture truck stopped. He said, I got you all your furniture here for you. Where you want it at? So we had to move in, which was convenient instead of waiting three, three or four weeks for the truck to get there. So we were there for three years. And during that time, about, this was 1980. In the uh, let me see. In the fall of 1980, they needed uh, a, a blood bank technician on a ship that was going out to uh, for training. So I I got poor for that and I went on the ship for 45 days. Big John. John F. Kennedy. And I stayed on there for 45 days and came back home and in uh, I want to say June of 83 I had to have orders, so I asked him to go to Florida. And he said, well, we, you're not going to Florida. You're going to Great Lakes, Illinois. I said, but I want to go to Great Lakes. I had 16 years in. So he said, well, I tell you what, you got three choices. You can you can get out and go home. You can go to Great Lakes and re-enlist. Or either you can re-enlist here and then go to Great Lakes. So I was stuck in Great Lakes. We got here in August of 83, and after that, I stayed here for three years, four years. My tour was four years, and we had a, uh, the hospital school was right down the street, so I, I went down and talked to some people I knew down there. And they recommended me to go down to go down there and teach. So I, I left the hospital and went right down the street and taught for four years, training a new hospital corpsman. And then I retired in October the twelfth of nineteen ninety, which is almost twenty three years ago. Back then, uh, yeah. And then I walked out, and 13 days later, at the 1st of November, I walked back in doing the same thing in civilian clothes. And I retired from uh, the uh, federal government in March of 2011. So I had 20, 20 years civilian service, 22 years in the military.
It's a lot of service. <laughs> so during your service, um, talk a little bit about your personal life, some of the things that um, that you had to do to stay in touch with family and friends and things like that. Well, I guess you could say I was one of the lucky ones. I had my family with me wherever I went. So I didn't have to. Uh, it wasn't that hard because we were together most of the time almost all the time of my service, except for the 18 months I was in the Philippines. And there was a point of time that you were stationed with your brother early on, right? Uh, no, we weren't stationed together. Oh, okay. I must be mistaken. Um, so talk a little bit more about the military side of it. What kinds of things did you guys do as military personnel to, to kind of entertain yourself? maybe on the ship or in, um, you know, some of the schooling you had to do, some of those types of things. I'm trying to understand. What did you guys, um, did you guys hang out together? Did, did you go to some of the enlisted um, hangout places, things like that? Well, not really, because I had my family there, so every night I was at home, basically. What did you do to pass the time on the ship? There's not much to do on the ship when you got gallons of water sitting around you. All you do is just go out and stand out there, look out and think, huh. write letters. Because what I was, I was really not part of the ship. I was just there in case they had an emergency and needed a technician. So whenever they did their their drills and stuff, I was not involved in it. I just went down back to my office, closed the door. Mm. They didn't know I was there. Can you think of any funny things, humorous things that may have happened during your time in the service? Any funny or unusual um, events that you recall? Well, when I was on the ship before I got before I got off of it, they had uh, one guy who was working in the pharmacy was stealing drugs out of there, and they had brought some NIS guys on to uh, undercover. No one knew it when they busted them. But then they, when I was there, they thought I was part of that. So I got up in front of them, all of them, and just stood up and said, look, let me tell you something, guys. I'm not NIS. I'm not anything. I'm just here to fill in for the, the uh, blood bank in case of emergency. All I want to do is go home when y'all get back to the United States. Mm -hmm. So it was like, it was a rough time. Sometimes you sleep with one eye open, mm -hmm. hoping nobody will come up and try to do bad things to you. Hmm. It was scary. Hmm. What about um, when you went to the Philippines or what what kind of experiences did you uh, did you encounter over there? Because that was your only location overseas, right? Right. So how different was that? Well, we, we had a few of us hung out together and we'd go down and the only thing at, at that time Whenever the ships came in, they all had to wear uniforms when they went on when they went off the ship to Liberty. But by being stationed there, you could wear civilian clothes, and you had a special ID that you showed to get that you could wear those clothes. And we'd go down almost every night if you didn't have duty and sit around and drink beer and, and have fun. Did you try anything different while you're in the Philippines? Well, if you get a little inebriated, they had this uh, delicacy they called balut, B-A-L-U-T. It was a, what it was. It was a chicken embroil, not quite cooked. And you, you now nah, I won't go into it. <laughs> so but anyway, you 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 you. It was a delicacy of the Philippines. A lot of a lot of them over there would eat it. So and you we tried just it. it like that. Did you try it? Once. 
and you did not like it. <laughs> okay. Um, so do you remember any um, officers or other fellow enlisted men that you remember that may have had some sort of um, impact on you and your personal life or people that you may keep in touch with today? I probably do, but I can't remember names. If I see them again, I remember faces, but I, names, I, I can't remember too many names. But uh, there were a few people that, that helped me out along the way. Yeah, good. Well, let's talk about um, your pictures that you have there. You have some other pictures that you wanted to kind of show. Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Well, this is a picture of when I was with, in Cherry Point, North Carolina. I was, uh, we had to, we had camouflage material. We were out there in the field doing the exercises and stuff. So somebody just took the picture and gave it to me. This is the picture of when I was in the Philippines, standing in front of the uh, ambulance, one of the ambulances. It was an off-road vehicle because there's a lot of hills over there. And this is when I was working on the ward. Uh, I was probably doing nursing notes or something like that. Nursing notes is like you, what you've done for the patient. And this is just a picture that I took when I got out of uh, when I got out of uh, uh, core school. They had a little place that down in San Diego where you could take pictures. The coat is not mine. <laughs> They just had that, you could put it on and take a picture. And I thought it was cool. And I had this picture made up. And up in the top left-hand corner is my lovely wife, Lavera. And I still have it. And this was, this picture was the first class that I taught at core school. I can't see it, but I'm right down in here. Uh, the guy next to me, we were good friends, and he ended up down there. So we ended up together for the first class that we that I taught. He had already had three classes on his belt. So you didn't. Um, you were one of the lucky ones. You said earlier that didn't um, that didn't see any combat. But did you hear of any people that you went through training with that may have? not made at home or anything like that? I did have a classmate that uh, went over. He was in the Army. He he was, uh, his name was Shelly Reed. I always remember him. And he never made, he didn't make it back from Vietnam. What do you remember about him? Hmm? What do you remember about him? He was a football player. And uh, everybody liked him. And the whole town was kind of sad when they found out that he had got killed over there. He was a good friend of everybody's. Good. Um, okay, well, let's talk about after the service. Do you remember um, the day that you retired and what kind of emotions were you feeling after so many years of service? Well, it was rough because... Uh, I, I had a, uh, a retirement ceremony, and when it was my turn to give my final remarks, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I was very f filled with emotion and everything about retiring, so I, I didn't have, didn't do it. But I did have a, a little party afterwards. Uh, we went over and had food and stuff and everything. So it was kind of emotional. Do you look back on that and think maybe you should have stayed in longer or were you or do you look back and say No, you know, you, you know, you know you know when the time to do to get out or retire. You know it's your time. And I really didn't want to go in place else. I was happy here. We had bought a house. Uh, 
joined the church and met a lot of good friends here so I didn't we decided that this was it okay and when and another thing is our our children were still in high school and we and that was another factor about not moving because if you taking children out of an environment and moving them to a different environment when they only got two years left in school it's kind of it impacts on them and uh, we didn't want to do that okay um so what did you do for those couple of weeks before you went back to work just hang out play golf have fun nothing really and then you went right back to the same job. Right back to the same job in a different uniform. That was the hardest part, trying to figure out what you're going to wear every day. Because <laughs> when you're in the military, you have a uniform. But in civilian life, you don't have a uniform. Did you find um, any of the people that you worked with treated you differently? No. Matter of fact, uh, uh, they embraced me. Did they think you were a little loopy for coming back? No. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, did you make any close friendships while you were in the service? That's a good question. Uh, yes, but, you know, it's been so long that I, I've, I've forgotten names and stuff. It was one guy when I was in the Philippines. His name was John Barabbas. We became really good friends, and he left for about three months before I did, and I never got a chance to see him. He he was in Chicago the last time I heard when he left in in nineteen seventy one. So. Hmm. so now, have you joined a veterans organization? I belong to the American Legion. I'm a uh, past post commander of the post. I'm a past district commander of the post. Uh, I'm also the community service chairman for the state of Illinois. Uh, we uh, take care of uh, selecting a Hall of Fame award, which is a, is a big award where uh, uh, a post will do a lot of community service for the for the area that they're in, erecting uh, flagpoles, uh, or helping out refurbishing a football field, something like that. What does your post uh, here in Waukegan do? What kinds of activities? Well, our post is basically dwindling because um, it's hard to get members now because the young generation don't want to, uh, they don't want to join them up. I don't know why. It's just hard for us to get young ch young kids back in the American Legion. Uh, we have our post does a Memorial Day program. We do a Veterans Day program. We march in the Waukegan Fourth of July parade. Uh, we do we decorate graves for Memorial Day and. Uh, When asked, we, we go out and do uh, funerals, posting colors for funerals and stuff like that. So what do you think um, could be done to help the younger generation um, feel more inclined to join? I really don't think it's us. I think it's the people that they listen to. Uh, There, you, this is like a hip hop generation. That's what I want to think about it, and they're not really into uh, service. All they want to do is go party and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, did your experience in the military influence your thinking about war or the military in general? No. Do you think that? looking back on it, you made the right decision in joining? If I had to do it all over again, there might be something I changed, but uh, I'm happy with what happened. Okay. 
Um, and so how did your service and experience, how did that affect your life? It was a positive. It was a positive. It, it, I grew up. I became a man, family man. Uh, I love my wife. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. Every person should have grandchildren. Uh, they're the love of your life. Uh, I would have had four, but God took care of that one. All right. Um, is there anything else you want to add that we haven't talked about? No, I would like to thank you for letting me do this interview. Although I didn't have too much else to say, but uh, thank you very much for listening to my story. Thank you. All right, and the time is now 10.39 a.m. Thank you. 36 minutes. <laughs> Very impressive. Wow, what a session.